Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in the Trek Game Telecom video, we're going to be going through an interview I had with AMD's Robert Halleck concerning their Ryzen range of processors. Now, I am going to have to read out Robert's answers myself because he's been very busy, therefore he's had to answer the email over a series of days, but um, I am going to put his answers also on screen so you can get his verbatim responses. But without further ado, let's go into this, shall we? Question. Can you confirm that there will indeed be multiple Ryzen CPUs available at launch, so not just the 8-core 16-thread models, and it will not just be a paper launch? He responds, there will be more than one Ryzen SKU available at launch. This is all I can say for now. I then ask, if you or AMD could list three things you're proudest of with the creation of Ryzen, what would they be? He responds, I'm a huge fan of our ITX-specific X300 chipsets for Ryzen. Since the Ryzen processor is technically a SOC, it already has enough built-in PCIe Gen 3 lanes and I.O. controllers to support USB 3.1 10GBPS times 4 NVMe and SATA drives. That's basically everything you could want in a tiny system. That means Ryzen doesn't also need an I.O. chipset on the ITX board. This saves area that would normally need to be on the route to extra connections that the chipset provides. The X300 chipset is tiny pinky fingernail sized chip that facilitates secure boot, TMP, TPM, excuse me, and other security related features. That's X300. X300 is connected back to the CPU with a dedicated link, freeing up more, four more PCIe lanes, now a total of 28 on X300 based motherboards for things like Wi Fi cards. Gig E and other companion chips uh, common in the ITX form factor. I think X300 is a great answer for our fans who have asked us to facilitate more ITX solutions in the market. I'm very proud, this is the second uh, part of the answer, to work for a company that unlocks all of its processors. We've been doing that for a long time with the Black Edition and K chips, and it's back with Ryzen. All not Ryzen processors are unlocked, so overclocking an X300, B350, and X370 chips. I know gamers have grown quite weary of being deliberately funneled towards a very small selection of overclockable chips with the other guy. I wouldn't know who the other guy is. And um, I know that not every user needs the highest end processors. Ryzen can be the answer. <clears throat> and three, while I cannot disclose performance or power efficiency figures, I do want to say that what I feel in my heart as a gamer, a PC enthusiast, I feel that Ryzen is what it needs to be. The internet hype train moves very quickly and also has a lot of passengers. So I don't want to be in a position where I've overpromised anything, but I truly believe that Ryzen is the competitive processor that people have been hoping for. And I think our aggressive approach to marketing, example, unlocking all of them, up to 8 core 16 threads at 95 watts TDP, ITX specific chipsets with Ryzen, Will welcome be, will be a welcome relief to many. Excuse me, and this is why we've got the text on screen. I asked Robert if he could confirm that some of the rumours that the chip is running at 3.9 gigahertz turbo at CES 2017 and 4 gigahertz for the final re uh, revision silicon. And he says, I have also noted during, as we have noted during our New Horizon event, our base clock speed for 8 core 16 thread 95 watt will be at least. 3.4 gigahertz. I cannot disclose more at this time, end quote. So the next one I asked, um, can you explain the basic synopsis of how both neural net prediction and smart prefetch works and their importance in Ryzen? He begins, smart prefetch. Applications have a lot of data associated with them, and I don't mean sound files, character models, and textures. The application's underlying code base is a type of data, plus that code can generate new types of data while running. This type of data has discernible patterns because humans wrote both the programming language and the code, and humans are creatures of habit. Ryzen's sophisticated algorithms learn the patterns of the code and begin to predict what data will be needed in the future, then preemptively bring that data into the caches of the chip. Retaining that data in cache makes it immediately available for execution when needed, eliminated a possible so source of latency penalties. Neural net prediction he says, this one's super nerdy level exciting to me. Oh man. Inside the Zen architecture is an actual AI network, neural network, that is learning and predicting what instructions inside the CPU were required. This learning AI also is predictive, just like smart prefetch, but instead of predicting data, 
NMP is concerned with knowing what instructions and pathways inside the chip will be needed for executing an application. Staying, to, staying on top of how an application can best throw through the chip also neutralizes a potential source of latency penalties. Together, Neural Net Prediction and Smart Prefetch represent a pretty big chunk of the 40% IPC we've previously cited. I then ask a follow-up to this, can you also hint how Ryzen learns the application? Like, does it remember what you've learned if you leave the application in the background? Say you go back to it after a couple of hours of web surfing. He responds, the buffer for pattern learning is not megabytes big or anything, so it's not room for remember hours or days of history. The buffer is typically flushed when you move from one app to the next, or, of course, when the system is started, restarted. That would manifest as a game or a benchmark being slightly faster on the second run through, as it now it has its patterns and behaviours learned. It's important for users to know that neither Smart Prefetch nor Neural Net Predictions have any knowledge of what you are doing, or how it is being done by the application. A useful analogy might be, we've designed a better pencil by watching how you write, but we've never looked at the paper to see what you've written. End quote. I then asked, most of our users are interested in Ryzen for overclocking, can you give information on how both pure power and precision boost? For example, if the CPU runs at 3.4 turbo, and I said at 3.7 turbo manually, is there still room left in the tank for the power draw? Let's say I have AIO, will Ryzen increase its clocks further, and this is obviously because of pure power and precision boost. Robert said that he's going to provide specifics on how overclocking functions during the media review process. I respond, um, with the inclusion of DDR4, NVMe, USB 3.1, uh, AMD are once again on the forefront of motherboard features and technology. Judging from what the board vendors have said in public, reception to Ryzen has been pretty positive. What's your take on this? He responds, I'm pretty infused about the quality and breadth of our motherboards coming out for the Ryzen project. All of the latest storage and I.O. support has been really premium designs. Love it. I say Mark Papermaster was recently quoted as saying that Ryzen will be a four-year architecture, which would be tock, tock, tock. Would you agree that AMD is being extremely aggressive in pursuing performance? He responds, I don't really want to speculate on the future holds or might hold. It's not fair to ask, not fair for the reality of silicon development, and not really fair for users to set expectations what could change a number of reasons. For now, I think Ryzen will reflect our commitment to bringing competitive, on multiple front, high-end desktop processors to the market. Next question. Does AMD feel that they've had a lot of pressure on them for Ryzen's immense exposure? He responds, Ryzen is very important to AMD and the wider market. We understand the significance, we live it every single day. I then say AMD um, seems to have made a big deal of SMT for Ryzen. Can you elaborate as to why AMD have been so aggressive with SMT technology? And also, AMD seems to have ramped up cache, improved branching, retire cache, load and store queues, plus several other important aspects. Does this mean that thread contention in Ryzen will be less of a problem than other competing architectures? Robert responds, what you've cited, SMT, better cache strategies, improving prediction, are to boost instruction level parallelism, ILP. ILP really means reorganizing incoming instructions into work that can be done faster in parallel. ILP is a major tentpole of the 40% plus IPC we've been promising. Almost the last question. AMD have also mentioned AM4 will likely be supported until DDR5, likely 2020, and of course, uh, the platform will also support CPUs. Can you elaborate as why AMD have decided to stick to just one socket for this amount of time? Do you believe it's better for customers of choice or something different? He responds, I think users are pretty weary of socket merry-go-round from the competition. It seems like not a year goes by when motherboards must be thrown out for a new one that's incrementally different. AMD is historically known for providing long-term sockets and with Ryzen will also be known for our flexibility of our socket infrastructure. 7th generation APUs, AMD Ryzen, and the future-based Raven Ridge um, APU will fit on this into the socket AM4 platform. <coughs> that will allow users to grow with the system through many performance segments or use cases and over a long span of time. One final question. There's a lot of discussion regarding the performance of the 16-thread Ryzen defeating the i7-6900K in the few official benchmarks you've shown on Handbrake, Blender, and a couple of games. 
this is certainly the case. Slight note that I didn't tell him. Um, obviously, we're referring to the uh, demo shown off of New Horizon, the Doom demo, um, and a couple of others as well. Back to the quote. Can you give any indication of whether we'll see similar scenario across a wide group of benches and scenarios, both single and multi-threaded? Robert Halleck responds, not yet. Though many users think we're being deliberately parsimonious with this type of data, the truth is that there's simply more to work on to be done before ready for the limelight. When we're ready, we will be this quarter, we will share. I just ask for a little more patience. End quote. And that's about it for the interview. Hopefully you have enjoyed it. Um, I don't want to reveal much more, but there is a lot more coming up on the channel <laughs> over the next couple of days. I have another interview coming up. I can't mention more about that. I am waiting for hardware at the moment to review KB Lake, and I have a couple of other review samples that I'm negoti negotiating with, excuse me, over the next couple of uh, days for other vendors. So, normal stuff. If you've liked the video, share it with your friends, buddies, cohorts, um, and, you know, comment. Let me know. And I'm sure AMD will be definitely reading the comments in the video, so let them know what you think, any concerns, any questions you've got. You know, I'm sure that they can probably uh, enjoy the feedback. But, with all of that said, thank Robert and AMD very much for their time, for the interview, and thank you all for the support and the viewership. It means an awful lot to us all. So, I mean it. From the bottom of my heart, take care of yourselves. Bye for now.